So today, I want to talk to you about blind faith. Blind faith. In fact, the Bible says that faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. Another translation says that faith is confidence in things that we hope for and assurance of the things we do not see. The common thing here is with faith is that you do not see it. Faith is believing it even though you cannot see it. And so faith is blind. All faith is blind. Have you ever been blindfolded before? Kate, I, I, want, I want to meet you. I want to introduce you to Kate. Come on out here, Kate. Come here, girl. She's walking a little slowly, and you'll see in a moment um, because she's blindfolded. And um, this is Caitlin Garcia, everyone. Everyone, this is Caitlin Garcia. She is on staff here at Alive Church. She does an amazing job. She has her hands involved probably in everything around here. She coordinates our events in Orlando. And actually, she's an amazing assistant to Ken and I. I don't know what we would do without her. But Caitlin is doing a wonderful job this morning of demonstrating to us just how uncomfortable it is to be blindfolded. Now, some of you may remember being blindfolded. Most of us at one time or another have been blindfolded, whether it was um, in elementary school when we played pin the tail on the donkey, if it was a uh, birthday party where we stick the nose on the clown, whether it's a bridal shower or some type of uh, baby shower, we've been blindfolded. How many of y'all remember how uncomfortable it is to be blindfolded? It's really uncomfortable. In fact, normal everyday things that you would usually just do without thinking, for example, walking is a little uncomfortable. Caitlin, can you talk to us? Say hi, Caitlin. Hey. Uh, how do you feel right now? I just feel really lost. Okay. Do you feel like nervous? How do you feel yes. when I let you go? I feel very and, nervous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what if I just asked you, don't do it, but what if I told you just take off running? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. That would be like really uncomfortable, right? Yes. Because when you're blindfolded, you cannot see, right? You can't see right. anything. And actually, it's just like this, you're used to depending on your your, your vision for everything. But when I do things, you're like, what is going on? I mean, it might make you a little nervous. In yeah. fact, y'all, she travels with me sometimes, and she was in Alabama with me last, this weekend. And um, we decided to go to the gym. Our plane landed. Uh, we got to the hotel about 4 o'clock. So we're like, let's bust this out and get in our workout, right? Someone was coming to pick us up at 6. So we decided to go to the gym. I go into the gym of the hotel. Kate has her earbuds in. She has her kettleball flinging it all around. And I'm like, cool, right? I have my earbuds in, too. And so I'm about to go over to the treadmill and get my run on. All of a sudden, I'm walking by, minding my own business. Her arms fly out with a kettlebell in her hand. Her eyes pop out of her head. She's screaming like, oh, I didn't see you. Oh, I was so scared. So on top of being blindfolded right now, she is jumpy. So don't beat me up, Kate. You know, like, all right. it's I got you. all going to be over, like, in a minute. Um, but so... All I wanted Kate to do is demonstrate the, how uncomfortable it is to be blindfolded. Actually, I'm a little uncomfortable just looking at her being blindfolded. If you know, like I keep touching her because I'm like, don't fall down, please. Please don't, don't go anywhere. I don't want you falling off this stage. How do you feel? Ooh, I feel really scared right now. Like, I don't know how close I am to the stage. I don't know how many people are out right there. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all of this to say that being blindfolded naturally is similar to having blind faith spiritually. Because naturally, when you can't see even something as easy as walking, you're now thinking twice about it because you, don't, you can't see where you're going. The moment we say yes to God and we decide to step out on faith, we put a blindfold on. And even though it feels uncomfortable, you have to keep on walking by faith. Because faith is not seeing, faith is believing. Amen? Y'all got that? Okay, Kate. Boom. You can see. Say hi to everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, so 
there's this thing here in Orlando called the Sky Coaster. Does anyone know what it is? It's a Sky Coaster. It's like this amusement park ride. And it is actually the second tallest um, Sky Coaster in the world. It is a device where, or this amusement ride where you get into this burrito-like contraption and you get hooked to these, this huge wire or chain and it picks you up 250 feet into the air and then drops you down. And so this Sky Coaster, when I first moved here to Orlando, it was speaking to me, y'all. Because I used to be afraid of heights. I used to be really afraid of heights. And so now, whenever I hear fear speaking to me, I kind of have to step to it because now I know that God hasn't given me the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, not the spirit of fear to back away from the sky coaster. Y'all ever have fear speaking to you? So I would be driving by and the sky coaster would be like, Tabitha, I see you. I'm going to get you when you're sleeping kind of thing. And so in my heart, I always marked, you know what? As soon as I get the opportunity, I'm going to smack that sky coaster in the face. And I am stepping to fear, and I'm going to ride that sky coaster. So my sister-in-law is in town, and my brother, and they have a little girl. And so we go out on a family adventure, right, to the amusement park. And we're having a wonderful day, a wonderful time, until it all came to an end when my sister-in-law wanted to ride the sky coaster. And I knew in my heart already, that I could not say no because I already committed that I was going to do it. So I stepped up to it and I said, I'll ride it with you. And so the two of us very happily, we got together like a burrito, got wrapped up in the device and it started to take us up into the air. And we were laughing and having a good time. And I was telling, I was like, I'm so scared right now, really. Ha ha ha. But it was still funny, you know, because we were going to go do this thing. In fact, we were going up, laying down like parallel to the ground. We could see our children, you know, bye mommy, bye mommy. Our husbands looked really sad because they knew they had to take care of all the kids while we went up in the sky coaster. And so we were waving and everything was really just fun and fabulous until suddenly the fun and the smile turned to fear and intrepidation, y'all. I'm telling you, it went from smiling to like, oh my God, what have I done? Because as I got further and further into the sky, my body started to trip out. My mind was tripping out, y'all. I forgot that I was saved. I forgot there was a Jesus. I forgot everything. And so I'm looking and, and like, I was really tripping. I mean, I was scared. And then all of a sudden, the happy thoughts of, bye, watch mommy, it's going to be fun, turned into, what have you done? You are an idiot. How could you be so irresponsible? Who strapped you into this thing? It's probably a 17-year-old high school student who failed their math test. How are you going to let them strap you in and send you 250 feet into the sky? Have you lost your mind? And so I am tripping you would, I could have been by myself. My sister-in-law was there. It did not matter. This was my world right now. And I'm going up, tripping, and I just went like this and looked and realized that I was only halfway there, y'all. I wasn't even all the way to the top. I'm talking about fear gripped me. And I could not speak. I didn't say a word to my sister-in-law, and I just sat there. And all of a sudden, I just decided to just close my eyes because I'm really tripping right now. Like, I don't know if I just should cry. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I don't know what to do. Okay, Lord. And when I closed my eyes, I remembered like, okay, God, I know your word. I know I wouldn't have done this. No, I am smart. You know, my husband's down there. I mean, we all agreed to this. This is okay that you're with me. You'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. And when I closed my eyes, I began to feel my peace come. When I closed my eyes, I began to hear from the Lord. And, you know, studies say that when you lose one sense, the others are heightened. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says that, it, that faith is believing and not seeing. Isn't it just like our God, creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who knows everything, to tell us that in order to please him, we must walk by faith. In order to get anything from him, we must be in faith. 
But then he says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by believing in his word. That when we can't see it, that we can close our eyes and we can lean on the word of God. That when you say yes to God and you start walking by faith, you are blindfolded. You can't see anything, but you have the word, but you have hearing. Faith doesn't come by seeing, it comes by hearing. And so there I was hanging there, just listening to the word of God being poured out through my heart, the word that I had sowed in for years. And then I began to declare, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am a child of the most high God. Even though I feel afraid, I know God, you are with me. For I did not come up in here to punk out at the top, but I came in here to prove that fear was under my feet. You see, for me, getting up on that sky coaster wasn't just an amusement park ride. I didn't want to do it in the first place. But where I come from, a history, a lineage of fear that I was afraid of cats and dogs, and afraid of the dark, and afraid of the ocean and water, I was afraid of everything. And I learned in my walk with God that I cannot tolerate fear in my life. That anytime fear steps to me, I'm stepping back. And so that sky coaster was symbolic of me stepping out in faith. And what I didn't realize when I was on the ground happy and waving at everyone is that when I stepped out in faith, I put on the blindfold. And when you put on the blindfold, you cannot see and it feels uncomfortable. It's hard to take the next step. And you just have to trust in the word of God. You just have to trust in what God said. Will he keep you safe? Will he provide for you? Will he be with you wherever you go? Faith comes by hearing. Faith is not seeing. Faith is believing. And so what you have to understand is that any time you say yes to God, you put on the blindfolds. And some of you are here today and you've come into this place feeling uncomfortable. And your mind is tripping and your body is tripping. It's like you're hanging 250 feet in the air and all you can do is trust in God. All you can do is believe in God because everything you see right now is crazy. I want you to know that just because you feel crazy right now doesn't mean that you're doing the wrong thing. You see, when you step out in faith and then you can't see, it feels uncomfortable, but it's not time for you to quit. You see, Peter, Peter was a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus, one time, the disciples were out at sea. They were at, out at sea and a storm arose. Jesus came walking to the disciples on the water. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. No water, no storm can hold him back. The disciples see Jesus coming on the water and they freak out, y'all. They start screaming because they were afraid. They thought that Jesus was a ghost. Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. Peter's in the boat. Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, call me out on the water. He says, okay, come on, Peter. Peter steps out of the boat and begins to walk on water. But what happened was when he stepped out of the boat and started walking on water, what he did was he put on the blindfolds because he was so excited to get out of the boat. But when he got out of the boat, the blindfold came on and all out of the, now all of a sudden he's walking by faith and not by sight. And the wind started to blow and the waves started to pick up and the Bible says that he sank. And that's all that you're going through right now. That's all that happens whenever you say yes to God and you take a step in faith. When you step out of the boat, the winds are going to blow and the waves are going to come. But you just know that Jesus is always there to pick you up. That you will always win whenever you step out in faith and walk with God. Amen. Can y'all say this with me? Even though I can't see it, I believe it. It's blind faith. Would you go with me to Genesis chapter 22? Genesis chapter 22. I want to talk about Abraham. The Bible calls Abraham the father of our faith. And we're going to read about him having blind faith. It's a great story, y'all. And listen, some of y'all are going to be mad at this story. But stick with me. It gets better all the way to the end. Amen. Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Remember that. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. 
Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for a burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, uh, said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of you, and the two of them went on together. Then they reached the place God had told them about. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. When I first read that story, y'all, I was offended. I was like, I, I think I was mad at God. How could you do that? How could you suggest even that someone would sacrifice their son? I was mad at Abraham. Because what kind of person are you? Like, how would you obey God? Like, why would you, how could you bind up your son and lay him? How could you pick up the knife? I mean, this was just all kinds of wrong to me. God, I don't understand this. I, this is not how I know you. I know you as a loving father, as a good God. You have to explain this to me. You got some explaining to do, Lord. And so this is what I found. So Abraham, before he was Abraham, he was Abram. And so Abram was in a place, Abram's father was an idolater. In fact, it's suggested in other books that Abraham's father sold idols for a living. And in the time that Abraham lived, idolatry was rampant. People worshiped many gods. And so God comes to Abram in this time, in this time of society, when it's actually acceptable for human sacrifice. We're actually in times, of, um, uh, in times of really worshiping their God and in special occasions toward worshiping their God, they would, it would be acceptable to sacrifice a child. So God comes to Abram and he says, Abram, I'm calling you out of idolatry. I'm calling you out of worshiping these false idols. I'm calling you out of where you come from in your father's land, and I am calling you into a new land. And so now when I begin to hear this, I begin to see, oh, okay, okay, that's how God was speaking Abraham's language. He knew that it was Abraham would be able to relate to that. And so God calls Abram at the time out. He says, I want you to serve me and only me. I want you to serve me, the one true God, the most high God. And when he asked Abraham to lay his son on the altar to sacrifice his son, you see, God knew that it was a test, but Abraham didn't. We can read now many thousands of years later that it was a test, but Abraham didn't know. But God was testing Abraham, do you love me the way you love those other gods? Will you worship me the way they worship those idols? Will you sacrifice the one thing that you love more than anything? Will you do it for me, Abram? And see, at the time that Abram called God out, or that God called Abram out of his hometown before he was Abraham, Abram didn't have a child. 
He and his wife weren't, went childless. Um, his wife's name was Sarai, and Abram's name was Abram. So Abram means father or exalted father. God comes to Abram and he says, you know what, I am going to call you Abraham, which means father of the multitudes. And he says, in fact, change Sarah's name. You need to call her now Sarah, the mother of many nations. And he makes a covenant with Abraham. He says, since you have obeyed me and came out, since you have um, uh, chosen to worship one God and you've been obedient to me and you worship me, I am going to make you the father of many many. And many, all of the people on the earth will be blessed because of you. And so Abraham, Abram goes to God and he says, okay, now my name is Abraham, but I still don't have a son. You told me that my descendants will be like the stars of the sky, but I don't have a son. Lord, I am 99 years old and I still don't have a son. My wife, Sarah, is now 90 years old and I still don't have a son. God says this time next year, you're going to have a son. And so now when we put this into context, we enter into Genesis chapter 22, where God says, take that only son, take that son of promise, the son that was a miracle that you had at 99 years old and Sarah had at 90 years old, take that one son that I, you love so much and give him to me. Now we can see how God was testing Abraham because God wanted Abraham's heart because there was a mighty promise on Abraham's life. You see, Adam and Eve in the New Testament, the first man and woman made by God, or in the Old Testament, the first man and woman created by God, they represented mankind. And when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and disobeyed God, sin entered into the earth, not just for those two, but for all of mankind. And Abraham didn't know it at the time, but Abraham was representing all of mankind. Because when he said, yes, I will give you my one and only son, he was making a way for Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, to come into the earth and all the people of the earth could be blessed through him. Well, God, I'm not so mad at you now. I understand. I just had to go and research and get my history on the Bible, Lord. You see, God wants our heart. And when God tests you, it's not that he's trying to get something from you. Most of the time, he's just trying to get something to you. One of my favorite stories that I read is so sweet. It's about this little girl with a pearl necklace. You see, her dad wanted to bless her. He took her to the toy store and he said, you can have anything you want, little girl. Anything you want, you can have it. And he's ready to write a big check, y'all. She spends time in the store and she comes back with this little plastic, cheap pearl necklace. And dad is like, come on, you don't want this. This doesn't cost a lot. There's all of these other things. Pick something else. And she's like, no, daddy, I love this necklace. This is great. And so they got the necklace and they took it home. And lo and behold, every single day, this girl has the necklace on. And so now dad says, you know what? I'm going to teach her a lesson here. And he goes to the little girl and he says, that's a beautiful necklace you have on, little girl. Sweetie, can you give that necklace to me? And she was just like, no, daddy, this is, I love this necklace. This is mine. No, you can't have it. Days go by. He goes again and he says, sweetie, it's a beautiful necklace. Will you trust me? Will you give me your necklace? Can I have it? She kind of paused a little bit and like, no, daddy, it's, this is my necklace. I love it. And so a third time, days go by. Daddy comes to her and he says, sweetie, will you trust me? Give me that necklace. And she put her head down. Seemed like she was thinking about stuff. And finally, she said, okay, daddy. She took the necklace off and she put it in her daddy's hand. At that time, he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a genuine, real pearl necklace. He blessed his daughter. See, he wasn't trying to take something from her. He was trying to get something to her. He wanted her trust. He wanted her to know that as she grows up and goes into middle school and high school and college and as peer pressure begins to set in and the boyfriend says, it's okay, we can do it. And the best friend says and the roommate says, it's okay, one hit won't hurt you. He wanted her to know that she can trust in her daddy's voice, that she can always know, no, my daddy always directed me the right way. He always told me the right thing to do. So let me just listen to his voice. And see, God does the same thing for us. 
If God asked you for something that's meaningful, it's not that he's trying to get something from you. He wants to get things to you. God wants to know in this time, he's asking for your heart, not so that he can take it from you. He wants to give you everything that your heart desires, but he needs you to know that in this life, as you walk by faith and not by sight, when you say yes to God and you put the blindfolds on, now all of a sudden you're going to be able to hear the voice of your father that says you can trust me, that I will be there for you. Just lean to my word that I will never leave you or forsake you. Just ask and I'll give it to you. Knock and the door will be open to you. God wants to get everything good to us, amen? Blind faith, we have to walk by blind faith. And so, I was depressed a long time ago now. When I was 21 years old, I was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety disorder. I was heavily medicated. Um, I had a hard time coping with my past. I was born and raised in the projects. My dad died when I was six, lived with my grandma until I was 12. Then, I, then she died, and then I went into a, a, a house with uh, domestic violence, alcoholism, sex, drugs, violence. I was sexually abused, verbally abused, physically abused. And I found it hard in my adult life to just overcome. I found that in my adult life, you know, I'm still depressed and I have all of these wounds that I'm not able to heal. And so here I am in my 20s, I'm going to therapy, I'm taking medication. Those things are wonderful, they help me y'all. They, they help me stay married, they help me go to, go to work and come back home and just, just live life. But they did not cure me. And so as a young believer, I'm reading the word and I'm learning the word and I'm seeking God and I join a a new church like this one where they teach me the word of God and they told me that God is a healer and I didn't know that y'all, I didn't grow up in church. I thought, you know, miracles was just like something that you saw on TV, it was produced in Hollywood. And so even though I was a believer, it was just like, I had so much to learn. So I learned that God is a healer and I start to believe God for it. And so I went to God and I asked God in my prayer time, God, can you heal me of depression? And I really just released my faith and said, okay, I think, that, I think God can do this. And I thought that it was going to be like this one-time thing, like you pray the prayer of, you know, uh, to be healed and then you're done. But what I found out is that when I was praying, I was praying for God to deliver me from depression. And I heard God say, will you forgive? And my first response was like, Sure. Whatever you want, God, you've forgiven me of so much. I will do whatever, God, you, you, I love you so much. I will do whatever you ask of me. And so I happily smiled and said yes. And then as days went on, I realized I put on the blindfold when I said yes and I stepped out in faith. And now that I could not see, I was still believing God to be healed of depression, but I was also working on forgiveness because I had so much unforgiveness in my heart. And I thought that it would be one prayer, okay, God, I forgive everyone who ever hurt me, I'm done, okay, I'm healed. But it took day after day and week after week and month after month that I was still praying, God, I forgive them. God, I love them. God, I bless their children. God, I pray that they have a road to Damascus experience like you struck Paul, Father. I pray that you do a miracle in their lives. And what I found in this process is that God was asking me to forgive, and it felt really hard. It really hurt, y'all. What I discovered was that over the years in childhood and growing up, I I, I developed all of these wounds. And I didn't know God, I didn't have God, I didn't know what to do with them, but I just started placing Band-Aids on these wounds. And y'all know Band-Aids don't heal, they just cover it up. And so I was placing these Band-Aids called bitterness, Okay, I'm never going to let them do that to me again. Resentment. Okay, I'm never going to let that happen again. Shame, guilt, hurt. Band-aids. Building a wall around myself to protect myself. And in prayer, God was saying, give me that. Sometimes he'll ask you for things and it hurts. Give me the shame. And when I would give him the shame, I found out that it was just like he was pulling the Band-Aid off of this wound. And he was exposing all of my hurt. He was exposing all of my pain. And I felt vulnerable. And I was just open before God. And that's a hard place to be, y'all. That's blind faith. It's when God, everyone else is looking at me and I look like I'm good on the inside. 
but if you remove it all, Father, I am an open wound walking around. And right now I am so vulnerable, God, I don't know what to do. I feel like I want to quit this faith thing, but I'm choosing to trust in you. I'm choosing to have blind faith, God. I trust you that you're going to heal me. I trusted God, y'all. That's all I did was trust God. And kept on believing. And I cannot tell you, it's been 19 years now, and I have been healed of depression. 19 years ago, God took it away and it never came back. Some of you are here today and you feel that weight. Some of you are here today and you look so good on the outside, you're successful, everything is going well, but you're wounded on the inside. You're not as happy as what you should be. You're not as joyful as what you say you are. It affects your marriage, it affects your children, it affects your work, it affects your relationship with God. And some of you before, you've said, you know what, well, I've been through divorce and I've had that pain and I tried to get healed from it, but it hurt so bad I just came back. But now what you have to know is when you say, yes, God, I will give you the bitterness, I will give you the resentment, I will give you the unforgiveness because you will give me joy for mourning. You will give me beauty for ashes. When you step out in faith for your healing, know that the winds and the waves are going to come. Know that the blindfold is on and you won't be able to see, but know that God is with you. Faith is not seeing Faith is believing. Whatever it is that you need today, whatever it is that you've been dealing with, know that God has a plan for you. He wants you to walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus says, come to me in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. God says, give me your life of sin. I'll give you a life everlasting. Give me your life of fear. I'll give you a life full of joy. Give me that sickness. Give me that pain. Give me that thing that you've been holding on to. Your children that you've been hovering over and you're afraid to let them go here and let them. Give me your children. Give me your life. Give me your business. Let's see how far it will go. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. That word seek, when you look it up in its original context, means to purify or to strain. What that means is, you know how you take pasta and you put it in a strainer and all the water runs out and you're left with the pasta? If you take everything that is important in your life, if you take God, if you take your job, if you take your children, if you take your spouse and you put it in the strainer, you know what better come out on top? It better be God. Seek God first. Does that mean that everything else isn't important? No. Because I love my children, I love my husband, I love my job, but what it means is that God, without you, none of those things are possible. Without you, God, nothing else matters. But if I have you first, all of those other things will be added unto me. God wants our heart. He wants our trust. He wants our blind faith. And so Abraham had blind faith, and I want to point this out here in the Bible. Something that Isaac said to his father as they were on the way to the sacrifice. Isaac said, Daddy, we have the wood for the fire. We have the wood for the sacrifice and we have the fire, but where's the lamb? Abraham said, it's okay, son. God is going to provide the lamb. Wow. How did he have such faith? He was moving on in faith. In fact, he even told his assistants who were with him, stay here, me and the son are going up, but then we'll be back down later. He was speaking by faith. What gave him so much faith? Perhaps he had this relationship with God. God, you said that you would do it before I know you'll do it again. The Bible even says later on in the New Testament that Abraham reckoned in his heart that even if I did have to kill my son, I know God will bring him back to life again. I don't know if I could have that kind of faith, y'all. I guess that's why Abraham is called the father of our faith. But Abraham believed that God could even bring his son back to life. In fact, in Genesis chapter 21, the Bible says that God promised that Abraham's descendants would come through Isaac. 
And so I believe what Abraham was doing was trusting in the Word of God. God told him something. He heard that word and he never let go because faith comes by hearing. And so God spoke, your descendants will be like the stars of the sky. And your descendants are going to come through Isaac. And then God tests Abraham and says, sacrifice that son. But God already knows. But God, you already said that my descendants would come through Isaac. You already said that. And I know that you're not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent. I know that you were God and you cannot lie. Heaven and earth would pass away lest one jot or tilt of your word should ever fail God. And so what Abraham did is that he believed God. He believed the word that God had already spoken. That's how he was able to pass the test. And what I want you to know, children of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God, kings and priests, what I want you to know is that the test is coming for you. Some of you may be in the test right now. But you have to remember what God spoke to you. You have to remember the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what can you do if you stepped out in faith for your business? If God said, I want you to start a second location, what do you do? God, I remember what you said. That's what Abraham did. I remember what you said, God. I remember your word and you keep on believing until you see it come to pass. Abraham believed that God would rescue his son and he did. When this was all said and done, y'all, Abraham declared, God is Jehovah Jireh, my provider, because he provided a lamb instead of my son. He provided a way when I didn't see a way. Even though I didn't see it, he made it happen. And what I want you to know right now is that Jehovah Jireh is still alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And there's a test that you're in, there's a test that's coming, but I want you to know that Jehovah Jireh is the God who will provide for you. If you need provision in your finances, he will provide. If you need healing in your body, he will provide. If you need help in your relationship with your spouse, with your children, he will provide. If you need help, God, I don't know what to do in my business right now, he will provide. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God who provides. Amen. blind faith. God is calling us to walk by faith and not by sight. Would y'all do me a favor and stand up? I want to pray with you today. I want to pray with you today. Some of you came in this place and you've been really challenged in your faith. You felt real uncomfortable, like I said, hanging 250 feet in the air. You're like, God, it looks crazy. It feels crazy. All I did was step out on your word. You said you would do it, but now all hell seems like it's breaking loose in my life. God, what do I do? The word for you today is stand. Believe in God. If you stepped out on his word, his word cannot fail. It will not fail because he would not be God. He's God. And his word will come to pass in your life. And so if that's you and I'm talking to you today, would you just raise your hand and receive? I want to pray over you that you will have faith to move mountains. Right now, Father, in Jesus' name, I lift up every person in this place that is seeking your face, Lord. Every hand that is lifted in their hearts that are open to you. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I just want to declare your blessing over their life. I want to declare a spirit of faith to rise up on the inside of them like never before. That they will have faith to move mountains. That they will have faith to go through any storm. Faith for every challenge that rises their way, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray that they will trust in your word like never before, that they will seek your heart, Lord. And as they give up things that they have been holding on to, as they give up things that, Lord, have been standing in the way between you and them, that you reward them with your love, that you reward them with your kindness, that they will see the salvation of the Lord, that the days are getting better and better from them. I declare that you're taking them from one level of glory to another. I declare over their lives in this faith challenge that they're in right now, that they are victorious, that they are the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath, that they will do everything that you promise them, that they will do everything that you've set them to do in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody who agrees with that, will you say amen? Do you receive the word of God today alive, church?
Don't we serve a mighty God? Listen, I want to do one more thing before I leave the stage. I just want to give you the opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I just don't want to take for granted that everyone knows Jesus and everyone has said the prayer of salvation. I was 21 years old, y'all, when I got saved. At 21 years old, I was diagnosed with severe depression and anxiety disorder. I was suicidal. I separated myself from everyone that I knew, from my friends, from my family, from my loved ones. And I just, I just needed to be alone. I didn't know if there was a God. I didn't know my purpose. I was so stuck in the past that I couldn't live in the present. I didn't have a future. And one day I was laying in my bedroom of my apartment as a college student and I heard a knock at my door. It's a miracle that I opened the door, y'all, but I opened the door. And standing there were three men with white shirts, ties, and Bibles on. Now this was back in the day when people used to go to house to house and witness for Jesus. And I'm looking at these guys like, you know, what are you doing? But they tell me about Jesus and they pray with me. Change my life forever, y'all. I remember it like it was yesterday. Because they didn't know before then that I had bought a Bible. I, I, I caught a bus, I went to Walmart and I bought this Bible and I started reading the Bible and I read the story about Jesus, how he died for the sins of all of those people. And I cried in my bed that night, y'all, reading the story. But I didn't understand that he died for me. I wasn't good enough. I couldn't even fathom that somebody cared about me that much. And when these three men stood at the door and told me that Jesus loved me and that that was a love story to me, it changed my life forever. I received a love that I had never known before. Didn't know that from my daddy. Didn't know that from my mother. And I received hope that if there's a God who gave his life for me, I can probably do something with my life. And from that day, my life never changed. And I don't know who you are right now, what you've been through, what you're dealing with, but God does. And he wants to meet you right where you are. He wants a relationship with you. He wants your heart. He wants to change your life like mine was changed. I never would have guessed 20 years ago that I would be standing on the stage preaching the gospel, but here I am. What can God do in your life? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Act like no one else is in this place. And I just want to ask you, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Tab, I've never said the prayer of salvation. I've never accepted Jesus into my heart. This might be your first time in church. This might be the first time you've ever even heard the gospel. If that's you and you say, you know what, but I want to know this Jesus that you've been talking about, would you raise your hand, please? Every head bow, every eye close. Raise your hand. Just let me know that I'm praying with you. Thank you so much. I see your hand. Thank you so much. I see your hand. You can put it down. Thank you so much. I see your hand. You can put it down. Listen, more importantly than me seeing your hand, God sees your hand. God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you need, and he has a plan for your life. It starts today. And so all I'm going to do is say a simple prayer, and I want you to repeat after me. And when you say this prayer, that's all I did with those three guys on my porch that afternoon when they shared the gospel with me. I prayed with them. They led me in a prayer, and now I know Jesus. And so if that's you, I want to give you one more opportunity to put your hand up real quickly. Put your hand up. Let me know that I'm praying with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I see your hand. Thank you. 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 I see your hand. There's hands going up all over the place. God is rejoicing in heaven right now. Let me tell you. I want to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. And can I ask all of you who have said this prayer already, would you join in with us who are saying it for the very first time? Repeat after me, dear Father, I need you today. I realize that I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I need your help. Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord, be the savior of my life. Forgive me for my sins. I make you Lord forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, y'all. Listen, if you've prayed that prayer for the very first time, you are now a child of the Most High God. Welcome to the family of God. 
I pray that that message blessed you today. I know for me, God's word changed me. It changed me. It helped me overcome years of depression, sexual abuse, even poverty. And I just know that God's word is changing something for the better inside of you. Yeah, if this message today has blessed you in any way, you know the greatest compliment that you could ever give us would be to share this with someone else. You know, when I go out to a great restaurant, I don't want to keep it to myself. I want the world to know you got to go here to get that fried chicken and them sweet potatoes, man. And so if this has been good groceries for you, if it's been good food, if it's been life transformation for you, do us a favor, share it with a friend, comment below, make sure that you subscribe to our channel today. And we hope we'll see you again real soon. God bless you. We'll see you soon.